This screenshot shows the gender ratio in the audience of a video about Christian theology. It's an extreme example of a general trend which many theology channels observe. I asked for their permission to share their exact ratios in this video. What makes the ratios even weirder is that offline, most Christians are women. There's literature written about the lack of men in churches, and people often observe parishes that look like this. When I asked the professor who works in that domain about this online-offline discrepancy, she called that a conundrum that she's also interested in solving. To my knowledge, there are no publications on this topic so far. So in today's video, I'll share some facts about the theological content men watch so much more than women, and I'll talk about the churches men go to and which ones they avoid. First, it's necessary that I tell you how I even ended up knowing about this huge online-offline discrepancy in Christianity. A couple of months ago, I participated in a study led by Professor Chan and Professor D, where they interviewed social media influencers who post content about religion and atheism. Among many other things, I was asked about the gender ratio on my channel, and one researcher mentioned that most content creators they interviewed had a male majority in the audience. That was quite interesting, but I didn't think much about it. And then recently, I did some research on the offline gender gap in Christianity, where women form the majority. And I realized that things aren't adding up. Since Professor Chan hadn't collected any exact gender ratios back then, I decided to collect them myself, and I'll show them to you in a minute. Now, what should we expect to see? YouTube has about 55% male users, and about 45% of Christians worldwide are men. So, to simplify things, we can expect that a channel about Christian theology has a 50-50 male-to-female ratio in the audience. And now comes the surprising part. If you'd like to make a guess about the gender ratios, this is your last chance. Most of the channels I asked have between 73 and 86% male majorities in the audience on average. You can pause the video now to take a look at their individual responses. My channel also falls in that range. But there are some channels which have the balanced ratios one would expect. And you know what they all had in common? They were all run by priests, kind of. I asked Father Mark Goring, Father Chad Ripperger from Census Fidelium, and one priest who preferred to stay anonymous. Then also Keith Nestor, who is a former pastor, and Alvaro from Uniquely Mary, who is a former priest. They all had 50 plus minus 5% male audience shares. I don't think that having gone through seminary is the determining factor here. Rather, it seems that the type of content determines the gender ratio of a channel. But we'll get to that in a moment. What this data shows is that men are a lot more interested in religion than observations offline allow to expect. One of the reasons why men are underrepresented in some churches might be that religion is perceived as something for women. My hypothesis is that if men perceive church as primarily a space for women, they might be less inclined to attend, creating a self-fulfilling prophecy where fewer men show up because they expect other men won't be there. In fact, I asked you to guess the ratios of two theology channels, and you underestimated the male interest in both of those channels. I'd be thrilled to see if those results can be replicated through more formal research. The data shows that when given the chance to engage anonymously, like for example online, men show a strong interest in theology. So the situation with men in the church might be a lot less negative than some make it out to be, and in any case, the topic of the Christian gender gap is a lot more complex than it seems to be on the surface. Now let's get to the analysis regarding what determines the gender ratio of a theology channel, since there's quite some variance. In general, please keep in mind that the gender ratios can vary on a channel over time, so the ratios I showed you before are just snapshots. If you're interested in a more detailed explanation of the data I collected, including potential biases, you can pause the video now. It seems that the more a channel is about apologetics, the more extreme the gender ratios get. The screenshot from the thumbnail is one example of an extreme fluctuation. The person with that video preferred not to disclose which video that was from, but I can tell you that it's about apologetics and that the video had more than 10,000 views. You might be wondering whether there are also channels that have substantial female majorities in the audience. Out of the channels I asked, none had a majority like that, but I know that Emily Wilson said in one of her videos that almost no men watch her channel, and A Catholic Mom's Life also seems to have a mainly female audience. However, those channels often 
don't necessarily talk about religion itself, but rather about a woman's life from a religious perspective. It might also be that more traditional channels attract more men, but I didn't ask any progressive Christian channels to test this hypothesis. The reason why I suspect that more traditional channels might be attracting more men is that we see this trend in the attendees of traditional Latin masses. An institution that promotes the TLM found that the TLM is usually attended by about 55% men, with numbers varying between 50 and even up to 75% men. Another study which focused on young adults specifically found that 57% of the young adults which attended a TLM were men. This has to be contrasted with the numbers in Novos Ordo parishes. According to one source, in Novos Ordo masses, the typical share of regular male attendees is only 37%. I also asked you for your personal observations, and in total you could confirm that the TLM tends to attract the more balanced gender composition. It's important to point out that there are also Novos Ordo parishes with balanced gender ratios, so the TLM isn't the only type of mass that attracts men but it seems to be the case that more traditional parishes attract more men, resulting in balanced ratios. As Father Mark Goring once put it, Watered down Catholicism does not attract people to the Catholic faith. We can try this experiment over and over again. We will always get the same result. If we water down our Catholic faith, if we make it more politically correct, if we compromise the Catholic faith, people will not be attracted. They will not be drawn to the Catholic faith. The world might applaud us when we're embracing the spirit of the age, but people will not be attracted to the Lord Jesus because we're watering down his words. Statistically speaking, this seems to be particularly true for men. However, sticking to tradition might only solve the problem of male church attendance. I couldn't find any official data on this, but after talking to priests from fraternities that promote the TLM, it seems that outside of Sunday Mass, men are less likely to be involved in parish activities, even in traditional parishes. A potential reason given for this is a certain crisis of masculinity, or the fact that churches nowadays are more oriented towards the needs of women rather than men. David Morov also mentions this problem in his book Why Men Hate Going to Church, where he writes that men's religion is masculinity. So he argues that men feel uncomfortable in situations where their masculinity is questioned. According to him, church nowadays is a place that focuses on feminine virtues, which isn't inviting to men. I'd be curious to hear your opinion on this in the comments, since I have a very limited insight into men's needs for a more masculine church environment. The book didn't really convince me, and I'll include my review of it in the description. In my opinion, it's important that all virtues are taught in church, and I find it sad that nowadays virtues are gendered. Either way, becoming a saint doesn't require leaving one's masculinity at the door, which I'd like to show through the example of Saint Ignatius of Loyola. There's an excellent movie about his life, and I'd like to show you the trailer now, because I can't express what that trailer and that movie will teach you about his life. How many? 12,000, possibly more. Pamplona is lost, Loyola. I say we fight. He wants to become a pilgrim. He wants to go to Jerusalem and beg his way there like the holy pilgrims of old. But he's a Loyola. What will people say? If you could hear the voice of God, would you want to keep it secret? You know what this council is capable of. Do you really want to die? I have faced death before. It does not scare me. St. Ignatius was a soldier who spent the first 30 years of his life committing grave sins in basically all Ten Commandments. For example, the movie shows him visiting prostitutes and being violent. When we learn about the lives of saints, the focus is often on their life after conversion. This movie shows St. Ignatius as a soldier, a sinner, and a saint, and because his sinful past is not neglected, that makes him so much more relatable as a human.
Another inspiring layer of his life is the way his journey to sanctity started. One day in battle, St. Ignatius suffered a severe injury in his leg, which made it impossible for him to continue his career as a soldier. During his recovery, he read about the lives of saints and he just decided to become a saint. He wanted to become a saint to make himself great, and what fascinates me about this story is that it shows us that God can even turn someone like that into a saint, someone who desired to become a saint for his own glory. God took his ambition and channeled it in the right direction. This story can be very helpful for people who can't relate to saints who started their journey to sanctity out of love for God. Some people might not relate to having warm, fuzzy feelings that motivate them in the beginning. The life of St. Ignatius shows us that God can take a very imperfect desire to become a saint and transform it completely. St. Ignatius' life also shows us that ambitious people don't have to stop being ambitious when giving their life to Christ. Every earthly ambition will lead us away from God sooner or later. Examples would be the bodybuilder who neglects every other aspect of their life to achieve the perfect physique, or the business person that works 80 hours a week and also neglects everything else. God can take the drive in those people and redirect it to set the world on fire and to contribute to His greater glory. St. Ignatius shows us that one singular decision, one act of the will, can start this process. I've watched the movie about his life at least three times, and I highly recommend it. Finally, I'd like to address the lack of women in theology, or specifically apologetics, as we've seen today in the gender ratios of theological YouTube channels. Is that a problem? Does it matter how many women are in apologetics? Should we try to increase the share of women in apologetics artificially? In my opinion, that's not necessary. As a woman, I feel welcome on apologetic channels, and I'm sure that every woman who is interested in that type of content can watch it. There just seem to be fewer women interested in this content, which is fine. Women can enrich apologetics with their unique perspectives, but a discipline doesn't need to have many women for women to make a great impact. For example, in physics and mathematics, there are also a lot more men than women. But the few women in those fields made some amazing discoveries. For example, there's Professor Taimina, who is a mathematician who also loves to crochet. And because of that hobby, she was the first person who managed to create a physical model of hyperbolic space. Then there's Emmy Noethe, who was a mathematician, who in 1918 decided to give some attention to physics as well, which led to the formulation of Noethe's theorem, which to this day is often considered to be the most beautiful idea in physics. Similarly, women's ideas can also contribute to apologetics. So if you have a daughter, you can offer her apologetic books to see if she's interested. But if she's not, that's also fine. In conclusion, what matters is that as many people as possible, both men and women, get to heaven. And I hope that this video provided some helpful information on how to achieve this goal. That's been it for today. See you soon. God bless and bye!